Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dee Dee Stephen. The latest direction in cancer treatment has been towards potential cancer vaccines and immunotherapies, but continued research is important to understand how the body interacts with these treatments. A recent study performed at Mayo Clinic found a unique form of immunosuppression caused by brain cancer that could inhibit the effectiveness of cancer vaccines. The findings were recently published in the journal Brain. Joining us to discuss our researchers, Dr. Aaron Johnson and Dr. Kathy Ayasufi. Thank you both for joining us on the program. Thanks for Thank having us. us. Dr. Johnson, we'll start with you. Why don't you explain why is our immune system important and what does immunosuppression mean? Yeah, so you know, immune our immune system is incredibly important because we live in a sea of microorganisms and you know, we, we constantly are breathing, we constantly are eating uh, different pathogens. And we've learned over the years and through science, as well as uh, people who have been born with various immune deficiencies, that you don't live very long if you don't have a functioning intact immune system. And so many people obviously think about how we need an immune system, especially now as we're uh, fighting and working hard for a vaccination against coronavirus. You know, we also have to remember that sometimes we need an immune system for effective vaccines against other, other forms of uh, uh, other different types of uh, maladies that people experience. And one major thrust that's been going on for decades now is how do we trigger a very strong immune response against cancers? And so essentially we need our immune system to protect us against pathogens, but we also need our immune system for future therapies to work against these, these cancers. In the area that Kathy and I work in, we have a situation where we have the brain has a tumor and we have a situation where we're trying to get T cells to mobilize to the brain and, and fight these brain cancers. And the reason for that is it's very difficult to use a scalpel or a tool to uh, uh, radiate away the cancer, it, it, they, whereas a T cell can actually has the ability to recognize transformed cells such as cancers and remove them from us. And so for those very reasons, you need an immune system to protect us against infections. We also need an immune system that affects the vaccines and the future of therapies and cancer is the use of the immune system to go against these cancers. And how does the body react when it's immunosuppressed? So we know this from uh, patients who are uh, born out with a mutation, for example, where they do not have a particular functioning uh, cell of the immune system working correctly and other factors. And so we've learned uh, this can take many different forms. Some are extremely uh, difficult situations. You've heard of the bubble boy who has situations where they don't have appropriate adaptive immune responses. You have situations where people were born where their T cells don't have all the weaponry they need to fight infections. And that's another case where uh, they will not function appropriately. Often these kids will need a bone marrow transplant to get a functioning immune system that doesn't have that mutation that causes these things. And so um, when you're immune suppressed, also there's cases where in the clinic you have cases where you have uh, patients who are on immune suppressive drugs because of organ transplantation. And finally, we have infections and there's immune suppression, things like HIV where you have drops in T cell counts. And we know that the reaction to this is that you have uh, impaired response against things that are normally not a big deal. Quite frequently, patients with HIV that lose their CD4 T cells to such a level they no longer can handle just basic lung infections and quite often a severe complication is pneumonia. And so you can see how all these things come together as you start to lose the effects of your immune system and how it works properly against pathogens. You can start to see very quickly how these turn into uh, severe conditions. Dr. Ayasufi, you identified that brain cancer suppresses the immune system. Can you explain as simple as possible, um, how does this happen? When a glioma or uh, a brain cancer that could be, for example, a glioblastoma that we hear a lot grows within the brain, you can actually see that this growth of a cancer within the brain injures the brain itself. Now, this injury is what actually suppresses the immune system. So when a brain is injured, it effectively suppresses the immune system at several different stages. So broadly, immune system can be divided in two broad categories. One is the organs of the immune system that are primary immune organs, and these are important for generating an immune system. And these include bone marrow, as Dr. Johnson said, like a bone marrow transplant will give you an immune system, as well as the thymus. So these are immune, system, immune organs that are responsible for giving you an immune system. On the other hand, we have secondary immune organs, which are the organs associated with the immune system that the cells that got generated actually live 
And if you need them to go somewhere to kill a cancer cell or a pathogen, this is where they become activated and instructed to do so. Now, what brain injury does, it actually blocks both of these organs and stops them from functioning properly. It stops primary immune organs from generating a new immune system by actually physically shrinking them and changing their microenvironment in a way that they cannot generate a new immune system for you when you need it. At the same time, the same brain injury actually induces molecules within the circulation that can be detected in serum, and serum is a cell-free portion of blood. So these are systemic, they can be everywhere blood is, and therefore they can actually block immune system that was already generated at every point for every organ you can think of. And this is what makes it a double whammy. So when you have a brain injury, not only you don't have your already generated cells functioning properly, they cannot divide properly, they cannot move properly, they cannot have the weaponry they used to have to kill a cancer. At the same time, you don't have the ability to generate a new system to actually take over and compensate. So this is like a double whammy, and that's why it makes this particular form of immunosuppression very dangerous for patients. Yeah, okay, so, and then is this true for all types of brain cancer? And then what about other forms of cancer? Yes, so experimentally we have determined, because it's easy to do this in animal models where you can control where the brain cancer develops, where the cancer develops. So if we have a brain cancer, which is either a glioma or a metastatic brain cancer of any sort, like a melanoma or a breast cancer that goes and grows in the brain, if we can control experimentally where it grows, we can say with a degree of certainty that this definitely happens. And if the same cancer actually grows outside of the brain, we do not see similar immunosuppression. Now, when you go into the translational aspect of this into the patients, it has been reported that patients with glioblastoma have the exact same uh, forms of immunosuppression that we're seeing. So our results are very translatable. But it's, it's easy to look at GBM patients or glioblastoma patients because this form of cancer rarely metastasizes and it's often contained within the brain. So this is why we can sort of see parallels with our experiments. However, when you have a different form of cancers, by the time it is detected, it is likely that it's already metastasized outside of its primary location. So in those cases, it is not known to our knowledge what happens in patients, uh, but it would be interesting to look at some of those cancers um, and see if we see some parallels with these immunosuppressions. Yeah. What does this mean for the development of future cancer vaccines? Is this bad news for the effectiveness of this type of treatment? Yeah, it certainly sounds like bad news, but uh, on the flip side of the coin, if we know how this immunosuppression works, which is why we are working through, we can actually find how to reverse it. If we know what molecule is in the serum that is blocking functions of the immune system, we can simply have strategies to remove this molecule from the system, and that could be a great combination with immunotherapies or vaccine development strategies to actually be able to guarantee that these will have better efficacy. Without reversing this immunosuppression, it's like going blind into the system that we know is extremely immunosuppressive. So likely that if you put some vaccine into the system, it will also be immunosuppressive. But if we know how to reverse it, it is actually great news. And maybe some of our existing therapies will then work without any need for like developing anything like new from scratch. So if we can reverse this, we can move towards that direction better. Uh, Dr. Johnson, while we often focus on developing new treatments, could you explain why basic research needs to be part of this process? Well, I think the reason for this is that uh, I mean, obviously, there's a lot that is, you know, it's very critical to study the patients. I mean, the patients present with the patterns, the patients have certain factors that are going on all at the same time, and you need to know what those factors are. You need to know what cells are showing up to fight cancers. You need to know where the cancer is located, for example. But after that, you need to understand why are they there in the first place? Like, why does the T cell show up? but not kill the cancer? Why do you have situations where um, you have a hundred different cells in the same location and what do they do with one another? And I think 
those are the harder ones to figure out when people take like a tissue section from a cancer from a patient. You can kind of see in real in a static situation a whole battlefield going on. The question is, what do each one of those cells exactly do? And I think that's where you come back to the different modeling systems that we do in basic science. And in those modeling systems, you can take away and put back various cell types. You can take away weapons of cells of the you know, immune systems have different weapons they use against these cancers, and you can knock them out genetically so that they do not have the ability to fight the same way each time. And through these different simulations in the models, you can get a little bit closer to having an opinion and having greater knowledge of what are they actually doing at the site of the human cancer. And once you start to find out how those things work, you then can rationally design therapies moving forward that can go after this. In Kathy's situation, she's a lot of people had focused on the fact that different cancers would maybe promote immune suppression, but these were situations in the microenvironment of the cancer where T cells show up and they get turned off once they arrive, or there's other things that were, were well described. So the model systems that Kathy has been working with, for example, we know this is not the cancer itself that actually does this. This is actually the brain and central nervous system emitting a soluble factor into the blood, which is hitting different targets remotely, including lymphoid structures like Kathy described, as well as T cell activity. And so this is a novel uh, way by which this, this cancer has caused a condition which causes immune suppression. And you would not easily be able to determine this, for example, in the human patient, but you can start to see it in the models and it starts to connect those dots of what you observed in the human patient. And this next one's for either of you, both of you. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what's next in your research? We are obviously looking at what these molecules are. We have um, some you know, identification processes underway. We're trying to narrow down what kind of molecules are released from an injured brain. Um, we also have directions in this project where we are looking at if this is unique to just brain cancer or any brain injury like stroke, traumatic brain injury, and that will help us actually help more patients um, because if it's a common pathway of brain injury induced immunosuppression, once we figure out exactly how to get rid of it, we can help a large cohort of patients with both acute and chronic neurological diseases. These are things that you don't learn in textbooks. Like you, you, you know, we all go through our degrees as we take coursework and go to lots of seminars. And I think, you know, this was a project where I think a few years ago we had some extra mice in the lab and wanted to look at something different. And uh, we had uh, Dr. I see if we look at this, and suddenly she realized there was some some amazing findings. And I think it was it was that suddenly started three to four years worth of work. And I think that's kind of the important things you have sometimes is some of these initial findings are very serendipitous and they might have been part of another project. And, and part of why we want to support science is because you, you have these situations where you see things that as part of looking at something else. And I think that's an important thing to remember. And uh, there's, there's a lot of people who describe these things in science. Well said, great discussion. Well, our thanks to Mayo Clinic researchers, Dr. Aaron Johnson and Dr. Kathy Ayasufi. Thanks so much for joining us today. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well.